Good evening and welcome. My name is Anne Marie McGrory. I'm the Executive Director of Critical Care Services in Greenwich Hospital. And it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for tonight. We're going to share a presentation on trauma. Josh Hajar is our Trauma Program Manager in Greenwich Hospital. Dr. Chris Davison, our Medical Director of Greenwich Hospital Emergency Department. And Dr. Thanos Petrodos, Acute Care Surgeon and Medical Director of our Trauma Services. I hope you enjoy our trauma presentation. Josh? Good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me and see my screen? My name is Josh Jar. I am the Trauma Program Coordinator at Greenwich Hospital. Um, and what does it mean to be a trauma center? Uh, high quality care when you need it the most. So these are our vision, mission, and values here at Yale New Haven Health. Our vision is Yale New Haven Health enhances the lives of the people we serve by providing access to high value, patient-centered care and collaboration with those who share our values. Our mission is Yale New Haven Health is committed to innovation and excellence in patient care, teaching, research, and service to our communities. Our values are patient-centered, respect, compassion, integrity, and accountability. What is a designated trauma center? Trauma designation comes from the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma. This is the designating body that awards designation levels one through four for trauma centers throughout the United States. Level one is typically a large teaching hospital in an area that treats enough trauma patients or called trauma census to warrant a level one designation. Yale New Haven Hospital is a level one trauma center and one of the most premier trauma centers on the East Coast. We are a part of the Yale New Haven Health System at Greenwich Hospital. Greenwich Hospital is currently in the process of obtaining a level three designation. This means that patients who have suffered traumatic injuries can be seen locally without being transferred to other centers and treated here in our facility. This means that we have specialty trained trauma surgeons on call 24 seven who can refer to other surgical specialties to treat traumatic injuries on an urgent and emergent as needed basis. What are the advantages to having a trauma center in your town? For our patients, they can receive treatment for a variety of traumatic injuries close to home with providers they know and trust who are a part of their community. That's inpatient care from specially trained providers and nurses. Our follow-up appointments closer to home with providers throughout the Yale New Haven health system and specialty treatment from a wide variety of surgical and non-surgical specialties leveraging the entire Yale New Haven Health System and Yale Medical School. So no matter how common or rare your injury from your traumatic injury, your traumatic accident, uh, we will be able to treat it. You'll be able to follow up within our system. For our doctors, it's the ability and resources and equipment to perform urgent procedures to treat a variety of traumatic injuries at Greenwich Hospital, cutting edge technology as well as research um, and that supports procedures backed by the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma Best Practices. Uh, the American College of Surgeons has been in existence for 100 years. So we're actually utilizing an entire century of research data that, that the American College of Surgeons keeps um, and uses to guide clinical pathways to give up-to-date high quality care, uh, special training and educational opportunities for both our nurses, our providers and our community. For our nurses, we offer the Trauma Nursing Core Course. This is preparation for the initial trauma evaluation, assessment, treatment, and definitive care after the traumatic incident happens. This is special training to assure our patients receive the best care at the first point of contact in our emergency department. We, offer, we also offer Trauma Care After Resuscitation, or TCAR for short. This is education on how to care for a trauma patient after their initial treatment. This also involves care protocols, pathways, and guidelines and special considerations to enhance recovery from the point of admission past the emergency department throughout the spectrum of inpatient care until discharge to assure every patient that we touch with our trauma program may, has the highest level of care. For our community, a trauma center is a bastion of education and resources for members of our community. Trauma centers nationwide openly share best practice measures to improve outcomes. The American College of Surgeons maintains a database of all trauma patients treated in the United States 
and uses this to participate in research from this data. This data is used to develop best practice strategies and guidelines. Trauma centers must adhere to these measures, improving treatment measures and outcomes. They also must participate in injury prevention, education, and outreach to help reduce the amount of traumatic injuries that occur in their community. And I just wanna talk a little bit about our injury prevention and outreach. This is our Stop the Bleed program. Um, this is where we teach members of the community how to control bleeding. Uh, if there were to be a traumatic incident that involves bleeding, we also teach law enforcement, the fire department, our first responders and EMS, um, and just your average member in the community. We've been involved in bike safety fairs in Rye. We have done bike and car seat safety throughout Fairfield County and all through Connecticut as well, and helmet safety. And we have given multiple talks on fall prevention, which is one of our most frequent incidents um, involving, you know, using the use of proper footwear and, you know, reducing distractions in the home. And our lovely Dr. Chris Davidson here has given uh, speeches on, you know, preventing falls and how to stay safe and when to go to the emergency department in the past. And with that, I will introduce Dr. Chris Davidson. Thank you kindly, Josh, and uh, thank you, Amory, for that introduction. Uh, let me just uh, get here on my share screen. And if can you see my presentation? Yes. Great, great. Thank, thank you. So, so uh, as for the introduction, I'm, I'm Chris Davis, and I'm the medical director of the emergency department um, at Greenwich Hospital. I've been here since 2003, and uh, now part of the trauma committee. Um, since I've been here, we, we've had many advances uh, with stroke care and thrombectomy, heart attack care and primary angioplasty. Uh, and this is really our last uh, major bastion uh, to really provide comprehensive care uh, to the folks who reside in our community. So it's very, very exciting. Um, you know, in the emergency department, about 50% of our patients come from Connecticut and about 50% of our patients come from Westchester County as uh, Greenwich Hospital straddles uh, those, those borders. Um, currently, patients with traumatic injuries um, get triaged really by our local emergency medical services. And so they have criteria based upon uh, injury of the patient, what their vital signs are, uh, and they are set to follow that algorithm. And if a patient meets the criteria to go to a trauma center, uh, Greenwich Hospital isn't even considered and they're brought to a local trauma center. Uh, as part of our process, we will get our uh, emergency department and hospital on part of that algorithm when we uh, achieve our level three designation, meaning that we will be able to receive and accept uh, patients uh, who meet criteria for a level, sorry, for a trauma center, which will be great uh, care for our local patients. Um, as uh, Josh alluded to, we, we really have uh, fantastic uh, resources uh, to take care of many different types of injuries and patient presentations at the emergency department, as well as Greenwich Hospital as a whole. And our overarching goal is really to be able to provide care for any patient that presents to our emergency department 24-7. Um, and achieving that trauma designation status will allow us to do that. Um, currently, we, we actually receive lots of traumatic uh, injuries, uh, whether a patient walks in or is brought in or uh, comes via EMS. Um, we see a lot of motor vehicle accidents. There are a lot of back roads and major highways in this area, as you know. Uh, bicycle accidents are not uncommon, and it's not uh, uncommon for a patient to come in after a bike injury thinking that they, uh, you know, they have a mild injury then to be found to have a uh, moderate to severe injury based upon their, uh, their, their accident. Uh, a lot of sports related injuries. We have um, a very active community, which is fantastic. So uh, football, soccer, hockey, you name it. Uh, uh, and those associated injuries uh, we see with, with a, a degree of frequency here in the emergency department. 
uh, as Josh said, actually falls uh, make up a large component of our traumatic injuries. We do have an elderly community. We also have a lot of patients who are on blood thinning medications because of their underlying medical conditions. And so a fall in blood thinners uh, can be a, a bad combination in terms of leading to bleeding um, and needing to be addressed in the emergency department. We do on occasion have patients that are brought here uh, either by friends or EMS or whatever with gunshot wounds, with stabbings, um, burns, whether it's work-related or home-related, uh, not uh, uncommon. And then just with the use of heavy machinery, um, uh, injuries related to lawnmowers, um, you, you name it, uh, we, we've seen it and, uh, and we'll take care of it. So as alluded to, again, really the Port Chester Rye, Rye Brook, and the Greenwich EMS are our real two major services that bring patients to Greenwich Hospital's uh, emergency department. They play a critical role in the um, assessment of uh, traumatic injuries. And uh, it's important that they recognize traumatic injuries that could have occurred based on mechanism of the injury. Uh, they are responsible for stabilizing patients and um, to initiating appropriate care so they can put in IVs and start IV fluids if a patient requires um, volume, uh, if they've lost volume or have bleeding during their injury. And uh, they follow their algorithms as previously discussed to transport patients to the appropriate emergency department and hospital for ultimate definitive care of those patients. Um, oftentimes the EMS are in contact with the emergency notification of a type of patient that they'll bring to the emergency department. So for traumatic uh, injury, uh, they would call us and tell us the age of the patient, uh, that they had a bike injury, uh, had abdominal pain with normal vital signs or abnormal vital signs, and would really initiate the plan of care uh, such that if uh, a patient was brought here and we thought that we would need urgent to emergent uh, subspecialty services, that's part of our process and program development that, that we could notify um, our trauma surgeons and get them on board uh, early and often for traumatic injuries. This is a, uh, a picture of our uh, trauma bay. Uh, it, as you can see, it has EKG monitors, it has a clock. We want to make sure that uh, we literally time how long it takes us to do things. Uh, time is of the essence. It has really all of the equipment that we need locally. So if Dr. Petrotis and or one of his colleagues comes down, needs to do a, an immediate urgent bedside uh, procedure, we have all those life-saving uh, pieces of equipment right there. Um, I'll just go back one step. Really with traumas, there are a few different subsets. One uh, group of trauma patients are ones that are clearly um, uh, you know, dead on the scene. Uh, then there is a subset that are major, have major injuries and need immediate stabilization and care. And that's where a trauma program can have a significant impact in terms of getting the resources to the patient. And then there are patients who ultimately have the traumas and are admitted to the hospital. So uh, by developing a trauma program here, uh, we really want to be able to initiate life-saving therapies early uh, as soon as the patient is, is brought to the emergency department. Um, within our emergency department, we have a radiology suite, which has a CT scanner and a plain films uh, suite, so that patients who require imaging, uh, it's, it's literally either next door or very close down the hall, so the patient does not need to leave the emergency department. And that's extremely beneficial, uh, really, for uh, high acuity patients. We don't want them to have to leave the department to go to a, the uh, radiology department. All these patients are able to be imaged and managed within the emergency department. Um, uh, Dr. Petros, I'm sure will mention, but if a patient needs to be brought immediately or urgently to the operating room, we have the staff uh, and resources uh, to get patients to the operating room 24-7. We also have uh, just outside of the emergency department interventional suites. Um, so that's where um, interventional procedures can be done. That's where our heart attack patients go, uh, but also sometimes with patients with trauma and bleeding, uh, the bleeding can be controlled um, through interventional uh, processes uh, by our interventional radiologists. And so that is close in proximity. And again, it's excellent to have those resources uh, within this hospital. 
Um, trauma care requires um, collaboration and a broad spectrum of, of trained folks who specialize in the care of trauma patients. We have emergency medicine physicians um, and nurses within the emergency department who are all uh, trained and specialized in emergency medicine and the stabilization of patients. Uh, trauma surgeons like, like Dr. Petrotis, anesthesiologists, radiologists, orthopedists, neurosurgeons. It really is a uh, requires a comprehensive of team to take care of patients with traumatic injuries. And again, we're very fortunate to have uh, all of these resources at Greenwich Hospital. <clears throat> so what do we do in the emergency department when a patient is brought into the emergency department? Um, we do a, a, what we call a primary exam, which is a, a, a very specialized exam to uh, really uh, include or exclude major injuries that could be life-threatening. We follow this A, B, C, D, E uh, algorithm here um, to make sure that they're able to speak and breathe. And if not, then we, we uh, would uh, uh, intervene. We check their lung sounds to make sure that they're moving air, uh, that they don't have injuries like a pneumothorax, a you know, punctured lung due to a broken rib. Uh, we make sure that their circulation is all within control, so there's no external bleeding uh, that can be controlled with things like pressure. Um, and, uh, and also, we check their neurologic status. These are things that can all deteriorate really quickly, and we want to um, identify them, recognize them, and stabilize them as soon as possible. After we've done that primary survey and, uh, and uh, stabilized the patient, we move on to what we call a secondary survey. And that is a really thorough uh, head to toe examination, uh, which would literally cover every square inch of the person's body uh, to look for evidence of any associated injuries. Um, a patient might have an ankle fracture that's obvious, but they could also have a, uh, a left uh, back or flank injury as well. And if we don't look for it, we will not find it. So extremely important in terms of the assessment of a patient. Uh, part of the evaluation it makes, is a determination of whether there's laboratory studies that need to be ordered um, and imaging. Imaging is extremely important in terms of making diagnoses and getting the right folks involved. Uh, so again, this goes back to where we have a, a CT scanner uh, at our disposal so we can get head CTs if we're worried about things like an intracranial hemorrhage um, and plain x-rays if we're looking for things like a hip fracture as an example. Um, just being prepared and getting ready uh, for an evaluation for a level three trauma center has really moved our dial in a right direction uh, because we need to get a lot of systems in place, um, which we have already. And so as you can see here, we have different uh, what we call trauma alerts. Um, and there are different team members associated with the different alerts and different response times, uh, depending on really how sick uh, the patient is with their trauma. So I won't read these, but, but these are things that we are aware of and uh, put us in direct correspondence uh, with the trauma surgeon on call, again, 24-7, uh, to speak about the patient and get the uh, trauma surgeon uh, notified, and, uh, and they come in in an extremely timely manner to assist uh, with the care and ultimately to provide definitive care. So how do our patients in the community benefit from a trauma center? Uh, it's sort of what Josh had alluded to. So uh, it, it, most trauma patients do require a multidisciplinary, multi-specialty response. Uh, and again, we're fortunate to have a lot of subspecialties on staff here at Greenwich Hospitals. So we're able to provide that. Um, being prepared and achieving a trauma center designation uh, means really by definition that you are providing timely care of patients, which is extremely important. And um, it, it requires a rigorous quality assurance and case review process, uh, which is always ongoing, uh, even especially after you achieve that designation, so that we make sure that we are always providing a standard of care and uh, exceptional care to the patients that we, we see and evaluate in the emergency department. With that, I will stop my share and uh, and hand off to Dr. Uh, Petrotis. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, Anne-Marie, Josh, Chris, 
those were like excellent uh, introductions and presentations. I don't have anything to add because this is this is great. Uh, I will try to just put together the uh, a little bit the uh, the past, the present, and the, and the future as to how we got where we are right now, and and discuss a little bit the the trauma evolution in the United States and how we want the public to be involved and what the future brings. So I came to Greenwich in 2005. I was in New York for like 14 years in a level one uh, trauma center where I did all my uh, training in general surgery and uh, trauma. I was recruited by a private practice in uh, Greenwich, the then surgical specialist of Greenwich, and then uh, recently by the Yale School of Medicine. I'm part of the uh, Division of General Surgery, Trauma and Surgical Critical Care, and I am the uh, uh, Trauma Medical Director at Greenwich uh, Hospital. Uh, Josh already uh, shared the vision, mission, and values uh, that we have within our Yale New Haven Health uh, System, and this is my uh, presentation here. Uh, if you look into the past, before 90, 1922 in the United States, there was no organized approach in how to treat uh, trauma. In 22, Charles Scudder, an orthopedic uh, surgeon up at MGH said, you know, we need to get together and just to find out how to treat uh, uh, trauma patients. And of course, what comes first? Fractures, because this is the most common trauma that one, you know, encounters in everyday uh, practice. And the Committee of Fractures was the first one that was organized by the ACS in 1922. And keep that acronym, the COF, because what happened afterwards the, the Board of Industrial Medicine and Traumatic Surgery merged with the COF to form the Committee of Fractures and Other Trauma. And finally, in 1949, after the Second World War, okay, the Board of Regents voted to officially change the name of the Committee of Fractures and Other Trauma to the Committee on Trauma, which is right now what you see in all those uh, presentations with a broken body is the COT, the American College of Surgery Committee of Trauma, and he has been around since 1949. From 1949 to the present, the committee has evolved over time to have various subcommittees and uh, the current four pillars, which is the most important, is the education, which is basically the advanced trauma life support, where doctors in the emergency room and surgeons and anesthesiologists and whoever else wants to be involved in the care of the trauma patient needs to go through. The uh, quality, of course, it's a major kind of... Uh, major major pillar of the uh, of of the uh, uh, american College of surgeons with patient reported outcomes and the uh, trauma initiative for the quality improvement and uh, of course the ems uh, disaster and mass casualty within the the systems and finally and it's the 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 step to the bleed kind of uh, pillar where the public and uh, the American College of Surgeons come together, and this is where I'm going to emphasize a significant part of my talk, because everything starts at the scene. We are very well equipped. We have fantastic EMS teams and trauma surgeons and uh, uh, anesthesiologists and emergency department doctors, but everything starts at the scene. And this is where we have this expression, stop the bleed, which... Um, uh, unfortunately, after the um, recent events in the uh, uh, the state, uh, it's not simply like a, a skill set, but it's a philosophy behind it. It's an adoption of a new role that everybody from the school to the college, then to the uh, community uh, should uh, basically adopt. We love to help people, okay? We want to help people all the time. If it's in the emergency room, in the streets, in the restaurant, on the airplane with a spontaneous pneumothorax, where you hear all these fantastic stories, this is what we do in the US, United States. We love to help people. But how are we going to do that? You get somehow to make a, a mental first kit in how to help them. Uh, and, and you make your own kit, okay? I put the mask in the middle there for obvious reasons. You got to protect yourselves nowadays with what is happening around with the pandemic, but also for other communicative diseases and excretions. But you got somehow to organize, you know, something in the back of the car to help right then and there. Now, the Hartford Consensus, uh, which uh, was uh, made up at uh, the Yukon, uh, was uh, basically the uh, the epitome, if you wish, of uh, stop the uh, 
the bleeding and uh, it started in 2013. We had three different consensi and the most important thing was the implementation of bleeding control. You all remember that if you see something, do something. So this is what we want the public to, to know and be educated. And we do have the means to educate the, uh, the, the, the public with the, our Stop the Bleed kind of uh, conferences. If you see something, just do something. An application of pressure to control the bleed and application of a tourniquet is the number one um, you know, action. Now, everybody should assume the role of the first responder, control the hemorrhage, and it should be ubiquitous availability of tourniquets. And this is what the college is aiming to do right now. Now, uh, the, the, the consensus has been endorsed by the, endorsed by the uh, President of the United States of, uh, of America and by all law enforcement and medical societies in the United States. Now, uh, you, one needs to accept a new role, apply direct pressure where the bleeding is, pack the wound and apply a tourniquet. And this is what we teach in our courses through the hospital. This is a little bit more kind of uh, specialized. One needs to be attention to be attentive when the kids have problems. There is a common error to apply too much pressure on a kid's arm. And in people who are more generous from the point of view of uh, body habitus, perhaps more than one tourniquet need, is needed to stop the bleeding. Now, I have this picture here because in the, as you, as you see, in the left upper quarter, it's the then major uh, David King, I believe he's retired now as a colonel, who uh, was down in Iraq and in, in Afghanistan. And uh, he was a major advocate of application of tourniquets in the community. Uh, on, the, on, on the lower aspect is the uh, Massachusetts General Assembly there, where they adapted to go to schools and start teaching people. It was the first state with David King going around in the, uh, in the schools and teaching people how to apply tourniquets. So I, I place this out there because we do that now through our institution for the uh, public. But um, uh, David did a fantastic uh, job. Uh, this one, I believe, costs five bucks, but it can save a life. Okay. You can find it in Amazon. You can find it in uh, Google. You can find it in any kind of uh, 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 store uh, on the internet. And uh, I believe it's five bucks. Okay, the, the cost of it. Um, uh, it's very easy to learn how to apply it. We do have courses where we can teach the public how to apply it, and it literally can save uh, lives. Uh, now, uh, the, um, the um, uh, device to uh, resuscitate someone uh, from an arrhythmia uh, has been ubiquitous. We're trying to make ubiquitous right now the quick clot, okay? And the quick clot is a very kind of a simple uh, maneuver. Basically, you take the gauze out of the uh, of the packet and you apply it where the bleeding is. And we try to um, to, to to have it next to the defibrillators. Now, again, uh, talking about history, okay? Norman McSwain was uh, a giant which uh, established the pre-hospital trauma uh, support and uh, 30 years ago taught the EMS people how to provide the ATLS protocol at the scene. And uh, this is the, uh, the, the take home message from, from him. What have you done you know, for the humanity today? What is the good that you've done? And I'm telling you, applying pressure, applying a tourniquet is of paramount importance. Now, looking into the future, we want, as Josh said to, and, and, and uh, uh, Chris and Anne-Marie to get the uh, verified level three trauma center, which is gonna happen within the next, uh, I presume, one year or so. But also we have to look into the future, okay? And the American College of Surgeons has um, made a statement for the next 100 years to minimize violence, to eliminate disparities in the access to healthcare, uh, to expand it to global trauma. The ATLS was um, the first uh, major publication of the American College of Surgeons and uh, course that has been adapted in more than 100 countries right now. We want to create a network of regional medical operation centers, and we are now part of a major academic uh, center, and that's a level three trauma center 
would be involved in all of the above. And finally, there will be in the, a National Institute of Trauma, like the National Institute of Health, because let's face it, as it was mentioned before, falls are very common. Okay, it's an aging population, and falls in an aging population are very common, and uh, it's going to become a uh, uh, a problem in the future more than it is right now, and we have to be very uh, uh, attentive. So, having said that, thank you very much, and uh, I'm going to stop sharing my uh, screen now, and we're ready for questions, I presume, or assume. Thank you. Thanos, it's, uh, it's Chris and, and Josh. I'm looking in, uh, some people typed in anonymous questions. So let me read the first one here and maybe I'll give my first uh, two cents and then Thanos, you can take over. Uh, so the first question is, what if someone has a bad fall with internal bleeding slash injuries how would you recognize what signs, symptoms should one look for? Uh, so that's a, a very good question. Um, when a patient is brought to the emergency department and even beforehand, uh, EMS sometimes conveys uh, the injuries. What are critically important are things like vital signs. So we're gonna wanna look at the heart rate, the blood pressure of the patient uh, and put that together with an examination. Um, you can actually have bleeding uh, within any internal part of the body. You can have bleeding within the skull, uh, which is very problematic, within the chest, within the abdomen, and that's part of that thorough head-to-toe exam. So what we really do is look for, uh, again, vital signs are critical, the actual exam are the pertinent findings on our examination, and then if we had any uh, consideration or concern about internal bleeding, uh, we would uh, uh, usually, usually uh, get something like a CT scan. So um, I'll pass this on to Thanos, but let's say we have a patient with a fall and abdominal pain and we do a CT scan with contrast and we see fluid uh, in the belly and we call Thanos, uh, what, what, uh, what would your response be uh, with a case like that? Yeah, sure. Uh, first, let me just go back to the, to the question. I believe this one comes from the community as to how would you recognize this one for somebody who, let's say, fell at home. First of all, and what signs of symptoms should one look for? Okay, so uh, Chris very well said that the blood pressure and the heart rate will be the first one to be affected. The heart rate is going to go up and the blood pressure is going to go down because they're losing basically the volume of the bloodstream somewhere in the thigh, in the abdomen, in the chest. So if you lose the, the, the blood, then the blood pressure is going to go down and the heart rate is going to go up. But you might not have, let's say, a machine to measure the blood pressure, okay? So you're going to check the pulse to see if they have a very fast and thready pulse, okay? And the majority of the people who are in the so-called hemorrhagic shock because they lose the blood, they look pale. They look pale and they want to fall asleep because this is how we respond to that. We want to vasoconstrict all our uh, uh, peripheral vessels. So that's why we become pale to give as much blood as we can to the brain and to the heart and to the kidneys. And uh, at the same time, the blood pressure drops. So if you have somebody who, who fell and uh, you are concerned that they might be bleeding, checking the pulse and talking to them are the first two things to look. After that, when the EMS arrives and, um, and um, uh, they come to the emergency room and Dr. Davison and his team takes care of him, of them and uh, they do the appropriate imaging, then what we do is very dramatic, which I don't think it's part of this uh, 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 meeting right now in presentation, but essentially we take the patient to the operating room and we have to do what we have to do to stop the bleed. Thank, thank you, Thanos. Um, I'll read the second one. Uh, when someone has a head injury, how would you know that they need to go to the hospital? Uh, so, so very good question. And, and we see uh, patients with head injuries in the emergency department all of the time. Um, and uh, there's a spectrum. So you've got pediatric patients, uh, young kids who hit their head. Um, uh, all the way to, to, to elderly folks, and they present uh, and have different situations. So first of all, uh, there's some concerns for, for uh, you know, anyone who hits their head. The question is, did, was there a loss of consciousness? 
that would be a reason to uh, bring someone to get assessed. If they hit their head and uh, were acting confused or not like themselves afterwards, uh, that would be a reason. If they had uh, nausea and vomiting, uh, if they had any associated neurologic findings, like again, like confusion, inability or weakness in an extremity, uh, those would be reasons to bring someone to the emergency department actually to call uh, 911 uh, because the EMS folks can actually uh, initiate things and, and uh, get you to the hospital faster if you're concerned about things like, uh, like an intracranial hemorrhage. Um, and then with folks uh, who are on blood thinning medications, uh, I would have a low threshold to bring them to the emergency department to be evaluated if they fell and hit their head. Um, unfortunately, uh, it can actually be minimal trauma to the head and combination with blood thinners can cause bleeding within the brain. So uh, it's a great question. And again, uh, headache, vomiting, confusion, mental status changes, loss of consciousness, blood thinners, those would be uh, uh, things that would be concerning uh, and would uh, certainly warrant bringing uh, someone to the emergency department to get checked out. Yeah, I agree. Mental status changes is the most important thing. I mean, uh, uh, slurred speech, uh, not recognizing the environment. And uh, there is a uh, something which is a little bit more elaborate, like the so-called Glasgow Coma Scale, where we check somebody with head injury, how they respond. You can do three very simple things. Talk to them to see if they talk back to you. Ask them to squeeze your hand. Ask them to move one limb. And then you know how alert the person is and how they can respond to stimuli. If they can't or any of the above is not appropriate, they need to come to the emergency room, to the emergency department right away. Uh, thank or you. On one. Thank, thank you. I think, Josh, maybe uh, uh, the, the two follow-up questions or following questions are both about the Stop the Bleed program. Um, so one is how can we attend a Stop the Bleed program? And one is where can we find information on Stop the Bleed courses and register at Greenwich Hospital? So I think, Josh, that might be up your alley. Yes. So the Stop the Bleed program, uh, we can come to you, actually, and that's part of our community outreach. So if you reach out to me, I will type in my email into the answers. Uh, we can come to your organization. We can come to your community center, whatever sort of public arena that you need us to do a Stop the Bleed program. If you contact us, we will work with you and come and teach Stop the Bleed. Um, you can find information about Stop the Bleed courses as well as emailing me as well. Um, and Kathy Carly Spanier is involved in that as well. So I can provide those email addresses as an answer to those questions. Thank you kindly, Josh. And uh, Josh, this one looks like it's actually specifically written to you to Josh, and then a second one, uh, is the full trauma alert, uh, I guess, does the full trauma alert correspond to the trauma code? So I guess maybe if you could maybe clarify trauma alert, trauma code, full, modify, what, I think uh, just a little clarification is what is sought. Yes, so at certain facilities, there might be other levels of activation. At Greenwich Hospital, we call our Modified trauma alerts is our lowest level of what we call trauma activation, which is it activates the trauma team immediately to the bedside, um, but does not require the same amount of resources as what we call our full trauma alert, which notifies our OR and puts our anesthesia team as well on standby to be prepared for patients who need to go critically to the OR. So our highest level of activation is called a full trauma alert, which would be equivalent to a trauma code at other facilities. Uh, thank you, Josh, for that clarification. Um, here's uh, another one. Um, if someone gets the wind knocked out of them, for instance, during a sporting event, but seems to be okay in five minutes or so, uh, any need to go to the ER? So uh, if anyone's ever had the wind knocked out of them, probably one of the scariest things, not only for the person who has the wind knocked out of them, but for the people who are standing around them going, what is wrong with you? Um, it's, uh, you know, usually, uh, you know, kind of a check, someone bumps into you, a direct blow to the chest, abdomen, and, and, uh, and you, you basically, uh, um, you know, thought it was going to help me, but I think basically with some diaphragmatic paralysis, you actually lose the ability 
to take a breath. And, and it's scary. It's uh, self-limiting. Um, and uh, as, as that uh, uh, progresses, one is able to actually catch their breath again and then breathe normally. Um, that happens not infrequently. And if that's the case, and then you return to function or that person returns to function and doesn't have any complaints about persistent chest pain or difficulty breathing or abdominal pain, then the chances are that, that they are a-okay. But certainly uh, uh, it would be concerning. Um, it does take a moderate amount of force to get the wind knocked out of you. So if you had any uh, persistent symptoms after that occurred, um, then, then that would be a reason to get checked out. Thanos, do you, do you agree with I that? I, I agree completely with you, Chris. That's exactly what it is. Uh, now, there is a uh, physiologic natural history of events. Uh, now, if you get a transient injury, which then goes back to normal, what lives behind is going to predict the future. And it depends, for example, whether somebody has a broken rib that functions the lung and the lung is going to bleed and slowly drop because in an hour or two, we'll know that the patient is going to go to the emergency department. If it was just a bruise, most likely it's going to bruise, is going to be away. The most scary of all, if you get the wind knocked out because you had a blow to the head, where we had that situation, which is called talk and die which is very, very, very dangerous because people can have bleeding in their brains and have a very lucid period, but everything is great. And unfortunately, develop a very bad situation in the brain and then expire. We call this one the talk and die phenomenon. Therefore, head injury, they come to the, uh, to the, uh, to the emergency room. Let's say they had a head injury and they passed out. They come to the emergency room. They had, let's say, an injury to the chest or to the abdomen and they fell down and they writhe in pain, but they get up and everything's okay, most likely they will be okay, but they need to be observed. If they fall down and they stay down, they come to the emergency department. And you know something I've always say my patients, not only for trauma, but also the, the general surgery patients that I see in the office for anything, okay? There's nothing wrong calling the doctor, you know what I'm saying? There's nothing wrong making a phone call to the doctor or making call for the phone call to the ED. I mean, we do have the means, we have the phone calls, we have the emails, we have everything to communicate. Making a phone call, it's not a bad thing. Thank you, Thanos. I think that we've um, answered the, the questions that were typed in. And certainly, I believe that this forum is open if someone wanted to voice a, a question or comment. Uh, that would certainly be encouraged and appreciated. Or uh, if someone wants to type in additional um, questions or comments, and we'll give a, a couple of, uh, a short time for that, um, and, uh, see how we can assist. I'm very pleased to see 30 participants. Very pleased. That is great. They, 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 our participants seem to be sharing our enthusiasm, uh, Thanos and Josh, which, which is great because we are very excited, enthusiastic, and, uh, and love, love caring for the folks in the community. Yes. So, um, I, I, I believe that, that we, we've answered uh, the questions. Um, I does not seem like there are additional questions. What I can say is that um, everyone on this call, uh, Dr. Petrotis, Josh, myself, and Marie, we are all contactable and reachable and happy to, uh, to in the future to answer any questions or, or uh, provide any services. I do see that Josh put his uh, contact information for Stop the Bleed. Uh, that, that is tremendous. There are certain things uh, like the Heimlich and Stop the Bleed. There are certain things that every single one of us uh, should, should know how to do. It just reminded me, I'm, I'm an ER physician by training, taking care of sick patients all the time. And uh, a few years ago, I went to the garden cafe within the hospital to get something to eat and was called over to a choking patient uh, and actually performed the Heimlich maneuver on him uh, and, uh, and, and saved his life. 
Um, a lot of people freeze, uh, and even they can be healthcare providers, but again, whether it's putting pressure or uh, a tourniquet or uh, uh, the mechanism to stop the bleed or things like a Heimlich, uh, I would certainly encourage everybody to learn about it if you don't know about it, um, because those things can absolutely be life-saving and time is absolutely of, of the essence. Um, and uh, Thanos, look at this. Will there be future trauma lectures to come? This is fantastic. Let's say yes. Yes, there will be. Uh, we don't have a time and yet, but uh, if, if you found this to be of interest, we appreciate that. And we certainly would take the time to, uh, uh, to, to do this again. Anne Marie, are you going to sign us off? Or, or, uh, or, or I believe we have a few more questions here that we should address. I apologize. No, no, that's right. It's okay. It's right. Uh, there is uh, from Samantha. Okay, uh, from Samantha. On the slide where you mentioned about the time response of the trauma surgeon, is that from when they arrive or when they call comes into the ED? Thanos, you want to answer that? Right. So this one is both in the sense when when the EMS calls the ED and they say that they have a significant trauma that will bring into the ED. The ED attending right then and there calls to notify the trauma surgeon that there is a situation so we don't lose time. Now, on other situations, the patient might walk into the emergency room or might be brought to the emergency room by family. Then it's by the time the ED attending you know, sees the patient and calls. But if the EMS, for example, call this, hey, we bring somebody in, then we've been called right then and there. Thank you. And um, from um, uh, Mr. or Ms. Perna, I'm not sure, at the start of events, as well as talking about fire exits, we should also mention where the nearest AED is. I used one at a PTA meeting. So uh, first of all, kudos for actually using one. That's fantastic. And you have a very valid point. Absolutely. It's best to know uh, when you have any type of gatherings uh, where that type of uh, life-saving equipment, equipment is. So thank you for that point. Um, from an anonymous, we got Stop the Bleed kits with tourniquets at our church and offered the class. We have 10 placed around our church with signage. Again, tremendous kudos. Um, th th those may save someone's life uh, at some point. And um, what can we use if we don't have a tourniquet? Thanos. Don't apply any, you know, uh, thing that you think is going to work like a belt or uh, like a sheet or anything like that because they don't work, okay? Uh, and we have, uh, the, uh, we have reviewed this one time after time. If there is something that might, might work, okay, is to have an elastic band that you're going to wrap it again and again around the extremity like a spiral. Not like just once, but like a spiral. So it creates, let's say, a gradient of pressure from you know, lower to higher. But uh, all the rest, unfortunately, they don't work. And, and I'd like to add to this. Um, if you don't have a tourniquet available, holding pressure, just holding pressure will save somebody's life. So you don't have to run, find a tourniquet or wait for a tourniquet. Just take off a shirt, put your hands on it, holding pressure. Is, is the priority. You're right, Joe, and you can hold pressure in the ambulance all the way to the hospital. It's, it's uh, don't let go. And when they say let, don't let go, you don't let go until you're in an environment where uh, that can be addressed. And, and, and Thanos, uh, sometimes people ask, you know, if you're putting direct pressure and blocking the, the, that artery to the lower leg, I mean, is, is someone gonna lose a leg because of uh, that pressure that was applied for the 20 minutes or 30 minutes? No, no, we're not going to. Uh, you need to have, a, let's say, extreme situations to, uh, to, to get to that point, to have, let's say, a, a ischemia to the point of uh, losing the extremity because of the pressure. Thank you. All right. Um, I believe now, Thanos uh, and Josh and Amory, I, I think that all questions have been, and they're great, great questions. And uh, on behalf of all of us, we, we thank you for those questions. We thank you for the interest. 
Um, and, and again, um, we appreciate the feedback. And if there are future topics that anybody's ever interested in getting covered, uh, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to address them. Um, and, uh, and, and Josh, you, you do site training, you said, right, for things like Stop the Bleed, that if there's- Yes, we will, we will come to you. We will come to your facility. We will come to your place of, of you know, congregation. Just contact me at that email that I offered and we will schedule something. Okay. Th thank you kindly for uh, your, your uh, attendance. Everybody, Anne-Marie, are we okay to, to sign off? Yes, I just wanted to thank all of you, our esteemed presenters, for your expertise and knowledge. We hope that the community will get in touch with Josh to learn more about the Stop the Bleed program. And we appreciate serving your community, our community, with the highest quality care. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation this evening, and we will have more to come. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. On this uh, national, I believe, uh, Doctor's Day, no? Uh, I wish everybody. Yes, uh, I'm sorry. Happy <laughs> National Doctor's Day. Thank to you. To our great team. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.